that's not my work, it's the Institute, uh, has been focused mostly on static seafloor measurements using a remotely operated vehicle. That's a F ROV, remotely operated vehicle. Recently, uh, the Institute have adapted the instrument for use in a moving vehicle. For the static work, the ROV was developed. Well, it, 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 an ROV was uh, developed uh, with a deployable, uh, deployable gravity and, well, it's developed an ROV deployable gravity and pressure for depth determination observation package. It consists of an underwater housing containing a spring mass Centrex gravity sensor mounted on motorized gimbals, a parascientific quartz pressure gauge, and a computer to control the sensors and transmit data. For AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle surveys, we are testing the idea that the motions of a commercially, a commercially available underwater vehicle, a Blue Fan 21, are gentle enough that can use a land gravity meter for the, under, uh, for the uh, underway survey, for the underway survey, and make corrections based on a vehicle tilts and vertical accelerations obviating the need for a gyro-stabilized platform. Uh, they mounted their gravity system in an approximately shaped pressure, appropriately shaped pressure housing, adding some tilt sensors, having suitable precision and dynamic range, and performed a series of dives with an AUV of depths of 35 meters. Uh, Dr. Mark Zumberch is a research geophysicist at the Cecil H. and Ida M. Green Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics Gravity Lab. His early research related to absolute gravity for which he co-developed a meter. Other interests include marine gravity techniques, marine geodesy, infrasound, uh, infrasound and geophysical instruments. Mark has received many awards, including, most recently, winning Best Paper for 2003 from the Journal of Geophysics. Dr. Zumberch received a BS with distinction in physics from the University of Michigan in 1976 and a PhD in physics from the University of Colorado in 1981. He has been with the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics since 1962. Uh, Absolutely. That was a bachelor's science. I was in junior high school in 1962, so that's... Is that a typo? <laughs> okay. Well, you really good. <laughs> well, well, with uh, no further ado, uh, I present you uh, Dr. Zimberch. Thank you. Thank you very for, much for having me. Uh, I, I was called by the, the Scripps uh, Office of Outreach and and they mentioned that there was a group that was interested in hearing about ROVs. And uh, that was probably prompted by the last summer's spill in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So some of the work that my group is involved in makes use of ROVs. And while I'm not an expert in developing ROVs, I've used them a lot and I know how they work and I even helped fix them sometimes, so I, <clears throat> I thought I would spend about half the time just talking about ROVs in general because they're, they're very interesting vehicles and then spend some time talking about my particular application of ROVs and at the end if we have time uh, I might talk about something else called AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles. So, uh, as you'll see towards the end, my main work has to do with measuring gravity on the seafloor, but a lot of attention came to these things called ROVs last summer, and uh, because of this oil spill in the Gulf, and you would read things in the press, like this quote from the Huffington Post, now, I'm not necessarily an advocate of the Huffington Post, but I, I went online to search, and you could see that the, these army of robotic submarines, each one is like 
Superman, but working underwater was kind of the the uh, the take that the press had on them, and, and that they there were there's a sub city full of them working uh, below the surface. And whenever I read something in the press that described ROVs this way, I kind of got the impression as this is what they were trying to <laughs> tell us that it was a cross between Aquaman and C3PO, but. <clears throat> I think that's really not the case, so I, I, I want to spend a few minutes describing what is an ROV really. Um, maybe some of you have used them for or, or, or seen them, but uh, one, one of the best ways to see what they're really like is to uh, look at a quick video that I found on YouTube just the other night and my daughter showed me how to download this uh, <laughs> this thing to the web so here it is right here so this this video is, is an animation that <clears throat> the French oil company uh, Total put together and, it's, and, and this animation if you go to the, the YouTube website, it goes on for 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, maybe if, if we turn that main light off, uh, you can see better. And, and why this is partly relevant, uh, Total is, is putting in a, a subsea production, oil production facility off the coast of Africa. And when they do one of these big projects, they make these incredible animations that show all the engineers and people working together uh, what what goes on in putting in one of these systems. So this animation will go on for about two more minutes, shows uh, an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. This big gray thing here that is about, you know, as tall as a two-story house is called a blowout preventer, and that's in fact what failed in the, in the deep water horizon accident. Uh, it's a series of automated valves that are supposed to slam shut hydraulically the, the wellhead if there's an accident. And this, uh, when they install one of these things, there's a, you know, the sea floor is here, there's a pipe coming up to a big manifold of sensors and valves. And on top of that manifold is this uh, blowout preventer. <clears throat> and an RO, and, and this, this is going on a mile underneath the sea surface. So you can't send divers down because it's too deep for divers to go. In the old days, you could send divers down, but then as the oil industry moved farther offshore in the deeper water, they couldn't use divers. They used manned submersibles for a while, but it's very expensive. Uh, and, and dangerous to send people down there unnecessarily. So uh, the, these remotely operated vehicles have been developed to do the kinds of jobs that, that people could do, although there's no one inside this vehicle, and the vehicle isn't making any of its own decisions. There's a guy up on the ship that uh, is looking at a screen that's displaying what the ROV's video camera is showing. And he has some controls on some manipulators that lets this thing uh, grab some connectors and move them around. So uh, again, this was an animation put together by the, by the French oil company Total. And, uh, if any of you is interested, I could I could find the uh, the YouTube link. Let me go back to the uh, so so that should hopefully give you a, a, a rough idea of what, of what these things look like and what they do. Let Let's talk questions during the yeah, yes please please especially this size. Uh, in, in the uh, communication link, is it, is it a cable or a fiber update, or is, is there some wireless that penetrates the salt water? It's, uh, it's a cable that has both
copper for power delivery and, and fiber optics for, uh, for video. In fact, uh, that was, I, I, I started to mention that the, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, it reminded me of something. The history of these things was that it's a certain era that uh, to, if a diver couldn't go down and grab a hold of a turn a valve and, or do something that took some dexterity and, and uh, be able to perceive what was going on, that the industry went to manned submersibles, which would be something like that, only a person would be inside so he could look out the window and see what was going on. He would still be uh, manipulating something through a, me a mechanical extension of his own controls. The, the biggest change in technology that led to these kinds of vehicles was fiber optics. Because quite often the, the cable would be uh, a mile long, sometimes uh, at Scripps we have some that are, that are 10 kilometers long, and to try to transmit high quality video as long as uh, over many channels, as long as all the other data channels and power links, you just couldn't do it with copper cable. And when fiber optic technology came along, it, it spawned a, a, a huge advance in these. So all these vehicles um, have, have the same pieces, and, and they're individually uh, different, but they have the same characteristics. So the first one is, is a flotation, an, an ROV uh, has to, has to float. It may weigh two or three tons in air, and, and I don't know if I mentioned the scale, but the size of one of these things is about, think of a Volkswagen bus, they're just about that size. Uh, they usually weigh several tons in air, but when you put it in the water, you want it to be neutrally buoyant, roughly, so that it doesn't take much force to move it up and down or back and forth underwater. They also have to work at at very high pressures, which is a problem for the flotation. You know, as you go down in, in water, you, you gain one atmosphere of pressure for every 10 meters descent. So, uh, most of the industry vehicles now are designed to work at 3,000 meters maximum depth. Some of the university vehicles go to 6,000 meters, so at 3,000 meters, that's 4,500. PSI is the ambient pressure. If you take a chunk of styrofoam and put it down about even a few hundred meters underwater, the pressure will squeeze all the little plastic air-filled cells down to nothing. <clears throat> it won't flow anymore. For deep water work, a, a, a kind of flotation called syntactic foam was developed that consists of uh, millions and millions of micro glass spheres, or little glass spheres that are typically about a uh, tenth of a millimeter in diameter, filled with air, thin wall of glass that won't crush under pressure, that's mixed in an epoxy matrix and it can make this buoyant volume that only uh, provides about 20% of its weight in air as, as buoyant force, but, but that's enough to keep these things floating and keep them right side up. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have some sort, sort of propulsion or a bunch of propellers that are linked to a closed loop system and a joystick moved by an operator on the ship. So the operator says go right or rotate and these propellers can, can make the vehicle do as commanded. They're generally uh, driven by a hydraulic motor. Uh, the more sophisticated vehicles actually have either, some have autopilot and some have uh, position control surveys where, or servos, where it can be commanded to stay in one spot above the seafloor in varying currents and conditions and, and it can hover and stay there to within a fraction of an inch. Uh, a very interesting part of the technology is in the manipulator arms, and you'll see later on a manipulator arm actually manipulating something, but these are uh, 
of multi-jointed robotic arms. Again, they are the, the vehicle isn't making its own decisions. There's a human being involved. Uh, these, these arms can uh, extend and rotate and, and lift and, and grasp. T typically, uh, they have seven different functions. And the operator has a, a small facsimile of this multi-jointed arm that on the ship he, he moves around while he's watching it on the video screen and it, it follows what he commands it to do. This, uh, this vehicle, by the way, is made by uh, the Schilling Company, which is in Northern California. And it's, they're really well known in the industry for their manipulator arm. cameras, lights, and sonars. As I mentioned, mentioned before, the, the fiber optic link to the ship allows for uh, high definition video from, usually a, a vehicle will have five or six different video cameras looking at different things. One will be devoted just to managing the tether that goes up, because always, pilots are always very worried about tangling the tether in something. Uh, now there's, a, there's new kinds of sonars that are almost like virtual vision because uh, working underwater it's very easy to, near the seafloor to stir up dust that makes the visibility very bad and, and for, you know, it's possible for 20 or 40 minutes to not see anything out from the video cameras because of the bad visibility and there are some new sonars that use arrays of, of uh, detectors to make sonar images. <clears throat> Finally, uh, they almost all use hydraulic systems to operate. Uh, because the pressure, the ambient pressure is so high, uh, you, you have two choices. If you have a piece of electronics or, or a motor or some object that was designed to run out of the ocean, and you want it to run it underwater, you have two choices. One is you can put it in a housing that keeps it at ambient atmospheric pressure, and then all the electrical lines, or if it's a case of a motor, uh, ro rotating shafts have to penetrate this housing. And the housings get heavier and heavier as, as you design the system to run deeper and deeper. An alternative is to find objects that uh, can survive the ambient pressure, and then like certain electrical systems uh, don't care if they're under great hydrostatic pressure. They wouldn't like it if the medium transmitting that pressure was seawater, because seawater's uh, electrically conductive and corrosive and has all sorts of bad characteristics. But often what is done is the volume that holds the object will be filled with oil and uh, sealed with just a, a thin pressure transmitting membrane so the equipment can be protected from the seawater uh, chemical characteristics but they're not bothered by the uh, ambient pressure. So hydraulic systems work very well on that because hydraulic systems they use oil running through tubes and it doesn't care what the ambient pressure is, it only worries about the pressure difference. So almost all our OPs rely on hydraulics for uh, their motors and pumps and, and uh, hand and tilt cameras. So now I'll show some, some pictures of some real ROVs. Uh, this this kind of looks like the one in the video, right? This is this is some underwater manifold on a, on a submerged oil rig, and this. ROV is, uh, you probably can't see it very well, but its manipulator, manipulator arm is reaching into a hole there so it uh, can turn a valve. Now, by the way, it's actually kind of rare to get a photo of the ROV working underwater because usually there's only one in the water at a time. It's complicated to launch uh, two ROVs from the same ship, although it's Nowadays, not infrequently done, but when there are two down there, it's easy for their tethers, which again might be miles long, 
of, of getting entangled. Mm -hmm. So uh, only in special cases do you have more ROVs, more than one ROV now. The, the deep, the, the deep horizon disaster was uh, one of those cases. In your animation, the vehicle seemed to move very smoothly. It didn't have any problem with keeping steady position and so on. Is that true? Uh, it depends a lot on the on the conditions. Uh, if there's if there's any current at all, then the the vehicle has to steady itself. And oftentimes, one of the one of the two manipulators is used to grab on the structure it's working. And now the, the whole vehicle is kind of clamped on there. It doesn't move, and the other arm does something. Hmm. But uh, we've had, well, I'll, I'll get to our stuff in a minute, but we've had vehicles inadvertently crash into our instrumentation that we'd set up and knock it over and drop things. So they, they're, they're not like in the animation where everything was very fast and smooth and perfect in reality. They're, Slow and a little clumsy. Here's a quick question. It's a dumb question. What what can be done, or what does is done, to keep the giant uh, white sharks or the uh, you know and major vehicle, ma major ma um, animal life, sea life to uh, break the course? Well, in do you, it's do you it's care more? In in some parts of the world, in some uh, equatorial regions. Uh, shark bites on cables are, are a big problem. They'll, they'll see anything moving, they'll go kind of investigate it, and the way they investigate it is by taking a bite and seeing if, if, it, yes. if it's something that they want. So oceanographers who put out uh, moorings in the equatorial waters where there's a lot of sharks have to worry about that, and the only thing they can do is uh, put a, a steel braid on the cable that's shark proof. Now, all of my work has been done in the North Sea where there's, uh, we don't have any problems with sharks. We do have problems with visibility sometime when we get, you know, 10 to the ninth shrimp per cubic meter and, and you just can't see anything because the backscatter light from the, from the animals is, is, is so bright. So when that happens, we turn off the lights, they go away, and then we turn on the lights and start working until they come back. Well, the first problem with whales, and lots of whales in the North Sea, especially, they 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 don't they don't present as much a problem. I've never I've never seen one. I've seen one standing on the ship, but I've never seen one down 300 meters. I'm so sorry. They, they could be. Oh, so it's a good question. They they, they have an issue. They, they do come into place. Uh, this is just a real ROV. These are our grabbing gears, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but just for scale, these cylinders are about two feet long. So this is just to show you that these uh, ROVs come in different sizes. This is one that we used in a survey one year, and this is one that we used in another year, and now there's those same cylinders about two feet there, and the ROV is much, uh, much bigger and has this fancy thing called a tether management system, which this whole structure is lowered into the ocean, and then when they get down deep, the ROV <coughs> separates from this thing, which is holding another spool of cable. So it's just a, a secondary spool that lets the ROV uh, easily maneuver. This is a this is a, a production platform. This is a control platform of the North Sea, and it doesn't look at there, but it's uh, it's probably the world's largest structure because the seafloor is 350 meters down and that's resting on the sea floor and it's just you're seeing the very tip of the iceberg. It's taller than the uh, than the Eiffel Tower. This is a new ROV that Scripps is getting, but you can see they're all the same. There's flotation, manipulators. Uh, this is a very famous one that, that Woods Hole runs that can run to uh, six. 5,000 meters depth, and, and here's one you can buy that fits in a suitcase. It's about this big, and their, their market is uh, high-end yachts where uh, people go to the Caribbean, they want to look at the, at the fish, but they don't want to go scuba diving. So you can get one of these. And these, 
that uh, has about 200 feet of cable on it, but it still has all the same stuff. It's got flotation, propulsion, camera, a manipulator, and, and this one doesn't have hydraulics if everything runs electrically. So they're all pretty, when you get down to it, simple devices, and they're all operated by human beings. Uh, this is a not a typical control station that would be on the ship. So there'll be two two guys sitting here. One is the pilot, and one is usually the manipulator operator. And so the pilot will have a joystick that drives the ROV around. And the uh, co-pilot has something that can move the manipulators or do what else they, whatever else they have to do. And they sit in front of a array of video screens, sending back the, the video data. And then there's all sorts of status and control displays for hydraulic pressure and voltage and temperature. And well, the manipulators um, typically often interchangeable, or you go down with whatever tool you need, and if you need a different tool, you come back up and there, the work we've done, it's always been, um, you decide on what sort of grippers you want on the manipulator and, and you use that. They have made some uh, underwater, mateable, hydraulic connections and some ROVs with a rack of different tools uh, that they can eject one tool and connect another one to a hydraulic line that will power it. The manipulators have the, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they are like human arms. They, they have, uh, you know, a joint here that can tilt and rotate and another one here that can tilt and rotate. And then they, then something that can squeeze, but, but the wrist joint can start rotating and, and keep going. So if you hold a drill bit in it, you know, you can drill a hole, or if, or if you hold a socket wrench, you can keep turning and turning. Okay, so that's sort of the, the basics on, uh, on ROVs, and now I'm gonna talk about the specific uh, project that, that my research group has been working on at Scripps for uh, a number of years, and it has to do with measuring gravity on the bottom of the ocean. And we simply use ROVs to get our sensors down to the seafloor where we make the measurements. So let's talk about uh, an oil reservoir, or in this case, a natural gas reservoir, for a minute. Um, an oil or gas reservoir is really a rock formation that's porous, and oil or gas, for one reason or another, fills the pores. Now, what, I mean, just a very hand wavy way, what happens is somehow biologic material gets buried in, in undersea rock formation, or, or rock formations down deep, they decompose, and, and it turns into either biogenic or thermogenic oil and gas. Those products are lighter than water, so from deep down on the earth, they're gonna to wanna to migrate up over millions of years. Once in a while, in their upward migration, they'll encounter some impermeable layer, and if the impermeable layer is tilted, they'll just migrate along and then go on their merry way, and usually it seeps out at the seafloor or on land somewhere. Once in a while, this impermeable layer is, has a dome shape, so when this stuff migrates up there, it gets trapped. And then that becomes an oil and gas reservoir. And geologists figure out where those are, how to drill into them to get a hold of the oil and gas. So, <clears throat> if this is a gas reservoir and you drill a hole into it and start letting the gas leak out, the pressure in the rock formation, in the pores, in the pore space in the rock, starts to decrease, because now you, you've let this pent up gas find its way out. One of two things can happen, and usually both happens, the seafloor might subside a little bit because 
now you've released some pressure down in the reservoir, or water from someplace else now wants to flow into this area where the where the pressure has, has dropped. The people managing this reservoir would like to know about where the water is flowing in and where it's coming from. Usually the reservoir is spread over a broad area. It's a complex geologic structure with faults and diff different parts of the rock formation that are connected to each other differently. And water will flow in more some places than others. And they get really unhappy when you know, one day they've been pumping oil or gas out of the ground that's you know, $80 a barrel. The next day they're pumping water out of the ground because now their revenue has, has, has been interrupted. And they plan over the life of the reservoir, which might be 50 years, to drill a number of holes and, and would like to know how to plan that. So they'd like to know what this plumbing is. Okay, that's a long introduction to explain now what, what gravity has to do with this. Probably everyone here has taken a course where they learned that gravity was how many meters per second squared? 9.8. Okay, everyone learned that. And, and what probably they didn't cover very much was that it's actually, that's kind of an average value, and over the surface of the Earth, a little g varies by about a half percent, and it varies from place to place depending on the local geology, and it varies from time to time depending on things like, well, the altitude of the measurement of that changes, you get farther away from the center of the Earth, gravity changes. Or if the density of the rocks underneath the observer changes, then that will affect gravity. And here's a case where the density is changing. You can't see down there to know that the water's there. So to detect the flow of water into the reservoir, you can use gravity. So you can lay out a, an array of stations on the seafloor over the reservoir, measure gravity at all those stations today, and come back a couple years from now and do it again, and take the difference between this year's measurements and the measurements a few years ago, and attribute changes to the changing density in the reservoir. So that's, uh, my group had been measuring gravity on the bottom of the ocean to do to learn about basic structure of, of seafloor geology and mid-ocean ridges. <clears throat> we were contacted by a Norwegian oil company that said, hey, could you help us measure gravity to monitor a reservoir? And we, we said, um, we said, sure. So what <clears throat> we built these gravity meters that can measure changes in little g of a few parts per billion. That corresponds to the attraction of a layer of water an inch thick or moving up and down in the, in the uh, uh, farther from the center of the earth by a couple centimeters. So it was it worked very well for monitoring these reservoirs and then we, we had a very interesting project that's the, the whole process in reverse and that is to look at a reservoir where we're not withdrawing gas from it and letting water flow in. We're pumping gas into it, pushing water away. And this is a, a CO2 sequestration well in the North Sea. We, we all know that CO2 is, is a very important greenhouse gas, and the major oil companies, believe it or not, are interested in knowing how to lessen the amount of CO2 that's released into the atmosphere. So Stad Oil in the North Sea uh, has a big natural gas production facility where they, where they drill down deep into a natural gas reservoir and they pump out the natural gas. But it turns out that it's not just methane and usable hydrocarbons that's in a mm -hmm. reservoir. There's other stuff. And this one, about 20% of it is CO2. Normally that CO2 would be stripped out and just released into the atmosphere. But in this case, on the platform is a separation facility that pumps the CO2 into an underground reservoir where we hope it will stay forever. And they've been pumping a million tons of CO2 every year into this uh, reservoir. A million tons seems like a lot, and it is. But uh, our own production of CO2 from, from humans on Earth is, is more like 
uh, I'll get the, let's see if I get the number right, it's two or three billion tons a year. So this sequestration project is really kind of a, a drop in the bucket, so to speak, even though it's the first very large scale CO2 sequestration. So uh, what is the, is that drawing on the, on the box, what was that showing across the bottom? What, what is that with time doing what? This one? Yeah, those, those flows show at, at this location, the CO2? Yes, I, I, I thank you for pointing that out. So this, this is a cutaway view, obviously, of the yeah. pipe coming in, putting CO2 into the volume. So looking from above in map view, these okay. are seismic surveys. I and this, this is an image After looking film. down. As time goes on, you can see this CO2 volume growing. Thank you. We'd also like to make a similar image with, with gravity eventually. Right now, all we can do is be happy that we can detect the CO2 at all. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, I mean, the, the gravity meter is, is something that was built in scripts. There's a, a commercially made mass on a spring. That's what a gravity meter is. You just measure the deflection of a spring holding a map, mass, but you know you have to do it with angstrom position sensitivity. It has to be on gimbals to be leveled when, it's, when a measurement is made and, and we have a little computer control system that does that. This is the inside of uh, a photograph of the inside of one of the gravity meters. We put three of them on a frame and de deploy three gravity meters at a time to improve the statistics in the survey. Uh, this is my own animation, so it's not as good as the as totals, but uh, this is what we call a seafloor benchmark, which is just a concrete pad that we put on the bottom of the ocean and leave it there for the next 20 or 30 years and provides a spot where we can put our gravity meters and every year we come to the same location exactly within a centimeter or two. They're shaped as a truncated cone to make them resistant to trawl fishermen. When we made them square-sided, we would come back and we would find them tipped over or, or gone because trawl fishermen blindly drag a trawl on the seafloor and pick up whatever's there and this way they kind of jump over. Oh, uh, the height here is about a foot and a half, and the, and the diameter is, I don't know, two, two or three feet. Yeah. Uh, so here's how we use ROVs, simply to, to drive down to the, to the benchmark and set our gravity measuring package on the benchmark so it can stay there for about 20 minutes. That's how long it takes us to make a measurement. And it lets go of the package because it's very vibration sensitive, sensitive equipment here and this thing vibrates a lot so we want it to not hold on and it picks it up and, and drives off to the next uh, next station. We'll, we'll put out, I don't know, 50 or 100 of these stations over a reservoir on the seafloor and spend about two weeks going from one station to the next. Um, this isn't very interesting, but it's, you know, guys that actually measure gravity get all excited about the RMS scatter of these measurements that is, is really pretty good. Yes? You said that it's very sensitive to uh, uh, motion and stuff. How does the, uh, does the current really affect uh, the measurements and the current for that? Or? The, the current isn't too bad. Because uh, uh, we've, we've made it fairly heavy, so it sits down and stably. But the, the seafloor itself, um, because of waves at the surface, the seafloor is going up and down a lot more than you know the, the parking lot outside the hotel here. The, right outside here, if you were to measure the amplitude of uh, how, you know how much does the parking lot move seismically, well from background seismic goes up and down about a micron with a, with a typical amplitude of four or five seconds. On the seafloor, it, it's, uh, depending on how deep you are, it's hundreds or a thousand times more. So we get a constant background of acceleration of the seafloor, which to the gravity meter looks like 
changing gravity. So we have to spend uh, 10 or 20 minutes averaging that signal away to, to get a good value. So the frequency of that vibration is every few seconds or something like that? Yes. Like, like, yes. like the ocean, like, like the swell on the ocean. <laughs> exactly. What about changes in position over time due to slip of the seafloor with respect to the underlying structures? Well, that's a potential problem. And I didn't show it, but in, the, uh, in our instrument package, we also have uh, very precise pressure gauges, which measure the ambient seawater pressure during the measurement well enough that we can get the relative heights of the benchmarks to a precision of about five millimeters. So if the benchmarks uh, move up and down, and that's what affects gravity if you move it up and down by, by more than five millimeters, uh, we, we can measure that. And we do have one, uh, one array that has a lot of vertical motion because the currents are unusually large there and it scours uh, the, the, I mean the, our benchmarks create a, a wind fence for sediments and they actually move up and down by as much as 20 centimeters and that's an important correction for us to make. The, uh, the ROV, I didn't talk about this, but the ROV itself is navigated with something called the ultra short baseline sonar. So the ship will have a series of GPS receivers on it that can tell the, the X and Y and the, the roll and pitch and yaw of the ship. And then sonar can get the position of the, the bearing and range to the ROV uh, and put it in, in GPS space with a precision of about a couple meters. So we know the lateral position to a couple meters uh, and we know the height to within a few millimeters. And, and you're right, it turns out to be important. So we make scatter plots to see what the accuracy of uh, the gravity measurement. Here's the, the scatter of, of results from a bunch of benchmarks in depth, and you can see we're doing just a few more. The different uh, figures on the, our different uh, measure locations. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so this, this array has about 20 stations. So the one represented by this black circle we visited six times and took the mean depth from that station, subtracted it, and plotted the residual around zero. And then this, uh, let's see, this one with the red diamond, a different station we only we visited four times and plotted its scatter around the mean. All the others we only visited twice, like <clears throat> this one, there's a, there's a minus six and a plus six, so that's, that's the mean. Standard deviation of all those numbers give us a measure of how repeatable. How, how, how much, uh, how would, uh, say, a six or eight foot tide translate into G's at the bottom? Uh, thank you for asking that. Uh, it's, a very, it's a huge effect. And so all these data here in the previous one have the tidal signal corrected for. So we... When we start the survey, we put an array of fixed recording pressure gauges on the seafloor so we can record very well what the tidal signal has been. And in the pressure measurements for height, the, tidal, the, the tide height has a direct effect that we have to subtract out. 